and this is something, actually an article I wrote in 2011 and forgot all about, found it by accident, and that's on yoga. Now, I don't claim to be an expert on Indian history, as I am, obviously, on Indian um, uh, health crises. But we all know that yoga has, you know, become this trendy, upper middle class, um, female phenomenon in America and in Western Europe. And you all know what it is, is that these people are, you know, they believe that somehow in their self-indulgence, they're transporting themselves to an ancient time because they have no culture. They have no tradition. They'll attach themselves to whatever they think could give them one because they've been uh, removed from their own uh, culture, whether it be mystical or religious, liturgical. They have no idea where to go. So the Beatles told them to go to India. So this is what they, this is what they do. Most of what's practiced in the West has no bearing on the actual ancient practice. It's a total fraud. Um, I mean, for one thing, women never did yoga in India. This was strictly a male phenomenon. It was an ascetic exercise. The things like the sun salutation uh, came was developed in the 1930s. These come from military calisthenics. Um, you know, most of the poses are, are you know... Um, Go all the way back to the 20th century, believe it or not. Um, but, you know, you have the ancient term, of course, from the uh, uh, Kata Upanishad says, when the five senses along with the mind remain still and the intellect is not active, that is known as the highest state. They consider yoga to be firm restraint of the senses. One becomes undistracted. For yoga is the arising and passing away. Well, that's from the 5th century BC, but that certainly is not how it's approached today, and it's beyond the ability of its, of its practitioners. Um, using the Sanskrit language, you know, some ancient terms was a way to, to cover over its, its modern creation. Um, I mean, the, the early references to yoga in the ancient texts have no relation to the present group of postures that presently exist. It was an intellectual struggle to cleanse the mind, and it had nothing to do with burning calories. Now you note that the, I mean, you know, Hinduism is, the term Hindu comes from British colonialism, it has nothing to do with with, with um, India. It comes from ignorance. It's, you know, they're not, you know, you know Christians, they're not, they're not Buddhists, so we're going to call them Hindus. It's a collective term. It doesn't mean anything. It's kind of like pagan. The word pagan essentially is a is a Christian uh, catch-all term that refers to any kind of um, native native poetry. These aren't necessarily religions, as I've argued many many times before. Uh, even using poetic images doesn't make it a religion. Uh, but these the the long list of ancient texts that yoga derives from, of course, they've never been placed under the microscope as the Bible has. So Westerners and, and you know take it as fact without interpolation uh, as a doctrine of faith. The the dominant um, text comes from the uh, Maharaj of, of Mysore. From, believe it or not, the early 1800s, and Mysore became the, the center of Indian arts uh, there. And the um, uh, Jodhavaniti, um was the compendium of, of essentially a compendium of classical uh, information about a wide variety of things. Um, uh, the Jodhavaniti is 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 this um, well, it's compiled by um, uh, Mamadi Waldiar, who was well known as a patron of, of education. But of course, even he was installed by the British. He was a puppet Maharaja. Then he was at 36. He was deposed by them for incompetence. Um, this is the text that everyone thinks is this ancient uh, 
you know, re- refers to these more ancient things. Um, but the, you know, those who were born in the 19th century began to combine what little they knew of, of ancient Indian ascetic practices with British military calisthenics. Um, uh, Krishna Macharya, uh, is one of the, who died in 1989, who taught people like, um, Yengar and Yoyce, uh, who wrote his dominant work with probably the first, you know, man to come to the West with this. He came under the patronage of the Maharaja of Mysore in the 1930s. And he depicts all of these, these poses and everything. And of course, you never find these in the ancient texts. The poses weren't done for their own, own sake. Um, most of what he taught, in fact, was, was, um, his own invention. In fact, one of the first things the Indian government did when they became independent was cut off funding for a lot of these so-called uh, yoga schools. Um, but, you know, this is not what people are taught. This is some, some ancient uh, religious idea. Because there's nothing religious in various poses that have uh, physical fitness as its, as its goal. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, Shrivaniti comes from numerous, uh, sources. In addition to variations from, you know, texts from earlier. You know, you have things like the rope exercises from Indian wrestlers, push-ups from the, the Indian gymnasiums, and, and then of course, the, uh, that became the sun salutation. Um, and the, but these are you know, these are secular notions. Are given yogic names for the first time, and are claimed to be a part of this of this tradition. And it's not the case. Um, you know when um, uh, Krishna uh, Macharya, when he first, um, and he went to the the um, Chaitanya as as one of his main main sources. Um. He systematized this as if these are ancient, ancient traditions. These are things that, that they, they strung together and gave them, you know, yogic names. Um, and he drew a lot of them from British gymnastics. Because the Mysore royal family, around the turn of the century, hired numerous British gymnasts to teach, uh, to teach you know, young princes of the, of the royal house, um, the physical fitness practices of the West. And some of these things are given Indian names and, and put in this, this book of yoga, which of course is the root for what Westerners use. Um, the Mysore Palace gymnasts, um, were even putting together Western gymnastics manuals. And they give detailed instructions. If you, if you've seen this, um, there are several books out on this. Uh, the, the Western texts give the exact same poses. That then later show up in so-called yoga textbooks. Like, for example, the, um, the cross like a jump back, um, is one that was of British origin that these guys have simply put in these, these textbooks and gave it a, a, an Indian sounding name and, and claimed that this was an ancient, uh, ancient phenomenon. Uh, walking the hands backward, you know, down a wall with a back arch, that, that kind of thing. Those are of English origin. Um, I mean, this is one of the reasons that the, the Indian government cut off funding for a lot of these places was because they were promoting something very different from what um, uh, this was. But um, so, you know, yoga as we know it today, this the asanas, the set of postures and breathing techniques, it does date all the way back to the 1960s, believe it or not. You know, the, the 5,000-year-old claim rests entirely on some uh, pictures found in the Indus Valley of a man sitting cross-legged. Um, you know, of course, it's a position most people sit when they sit on any flat surface, but uh, this is this is the basis of the claim. Yoga is first mentioned as a method of strapping horses together because our word yoke and, and yoga, actually, they're, they're similar words uh, with a similar root. Uh, but others, you know, other texts claim that it's not just that, it's, 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 it's the state of nirvana itself. 
in the works of uh, Siddhanta, for example, is supposed to be pure self-mastery. The texts, even those of, of ancient origin, have nothing to do with these crazy poses, but they have many, as many definitions of, of yoga as there are authors. And none of them refer to present methods of, of practice. It was a male ascetic exercise uh, for philosophical goals. It had nothing to do with uh, religion. But even Nirvana itself, um, the origin is strange because the, the, the va refers to blowing something, blowing like the wind, something out, uh, breathing in and out, or being blown out to be extinguished. The ancient Vedas have no mention of Nirvana being a state or a place that was taken by the Buddhists. Um, moksha is a different matter. Even there, though, you have you have different schools of Indian thought that um, take it as some form of freedom or liberation. But what is it? What it is that you're being freed from is is the issue. Usually, it's uh, means of liberation from karmic rebirth, samsara. Uh, both on Earth and uh, after death, but you know, you even you know, it, it's it's a it's a concrete ethical action within the world. You know, it's the liberation is an epistemological transformation that you can see truth behind the fog of of ignorance. That's what all metaphysics does. None of these are religious concepts, but you also have Upanishads that use yoga as a metaphor for a mental visualization technique. Um, but those texts refer to one physical posture. And the only one that they say is, is well, the, the one that makes meditation comfortable. So, you know, yoga might describe an old Hindu teaching, but so does the word avatar then. No one's claiming the James Cameron movie reflects an unbroken line of ancient sacred tradition. They're simply using the word. But the manual... Um, of 122 poses from the Maharaja is taken from gymnastics, both Indian and and British. But the Imperial British did kickstart this yoga fad, and they introduced the Indians to a new exercise craze that was sweeping Europe at the time. So BKS uh, Yingar, who died in 2014, had the idea of combining those exercises with some vague reference to old Hindu texts, like the sutras, you know, let all that loose in America in the 1960s. His book, Light on Yoga, came out in 1966, and that was called the Bible of Yoga. It had no religious content, no metaphysical content, uh, but it was advertised as an ancient Indian, uh, a retelling of an ancient Indian custom. But it shows you how easy people throw religious terms onto things that they don't understand. But, you know, if your scripture is from 1966, it's not an ancient religion. Um, but, you know, yoga fans really don't, I don't understand that they, you know, they're dealing with a, a slightly glorified 20th century gym class. Now, that gym class might be very interesting. It shows a tremendous um, uh, command of the human body and the circulatory system as well as the nervous system. That doesn't make it ancient, and it doesn't make it um, religious. Now, the like for example, the, the butterfly, uh, the butterfly kansana. When you think of yoga, that's the first thing you think about, the bound angle, right? Well, it comes from the pose, allegedly from Indian cobblers. They're sitting sitting in their in their workshops. Um, later on, it's it's said to represent the sun. Although I'm pretty sure there's no ancient text that says that. They even want to say that this the mantra is I am, which you see a lot in some of these Judaized um, 20th century recreations of what they say are ancient texts. But you're pretty much sure you know the Karens that are doing these, this thing, and, uh, you know, the Lululemon outfits have no idea what they're chanting. Um. But, you know, the point is, well, they claim that it gets it's destroyer of all diseases and uh, it gets rid of fatigue. So it will destroy all diseases and get rid of fatigue. It's also meant to remove frigidity in women in texts that are at least older than 1960. 
It's about directing blood flow. It has no, no philosophical content. Um, but the man who, you know, Yengar was the man who, um, you know, started this craze in America, but the book, a book is called Confessions of a Yoga Guinea Pig. And it was reviewed at the Huffington Post. And here's, here's a quote from it. In a rare interview, BKS Yengar, the 90 year old ambassador of yoga to the West, told me that his yoga, as taught to him by his master, was a purely physical exercise and completely unrelated to ancient philosophy. He says he invented and refined much of it himself. It wasn't until 1960, while on a visit to London, that English intellectuals introduced Yengar to the ancient yoga sutras. Five years later, he combined the yoga poses and the Hindu teachings together in his book, Light on Yoga, which sold hundreds of thousands of copies, actually millions of copies, in the United States, and voila, the modern yoga craze was born. It's a new age practice, not an ancient practice. So here you have the main ambassador, Yingar, who's coming, coming straight from that Mysore tradition, claiming this is all invented. Not only is it invented, but he actually learned the so-called Hindu tradition from the British. And he was in London when he did it. And it was in- English intellectuals that did it. So that's pretty much the final nail in the coffin here. Yoga isn't religious, but, you know, you read these Protestant fundamentalists and, and, you know, you should never read Protestant fundamentalists. Um, and they claim that, you know, Hinduism is this, is this religion and they think it's yoga. And then, of course, they mangle both. And if that's not bad enough, you have some of these crazies, they, they've invented praise moves. Try to, trying to Christianize yoga where you have an exercise regime with Bible verses. Now, can you imagine, can you imagine being so, so obsessed with being fashionable that you take an invented, um, Christian worship, what you think Christian worship is, an invented, uh, Hindu idea and connect it with exercise because you're told that's what you're supposed to do. Um, you know, and, and the BBC even says, that the mystical is gone from their religion. And so they go to the, <laughs> they go to what they think is Hinduism to get it. The whole point of the Reformation was to remove those elements from the church. And now because of their ignorance, they don't know where to look for it. They, they exercise everything that was traditional in their religion. And now having no tradition of their own anymore, they uh, they do praise moves. Um, but of course, praise moves doesn't require much of you. Becoming orthodox would mean that, that they have to change their life and change their point of view, and they would rather not do that. So yoga, like everything in American and British life, it's a product. It's a commodity to be bought and sold and has no reality beyond that. It's interesting to note that in California, a few years ago, some version of what they thought yoga was was being in, was done in the public schools, and the court said this is nothing more than stretching exercises. But of course, that's all it was to begin with. You had secular liberal groups and Protestant groups claiming to the courts that that this is religious uh, imposition, and of course, that's illegal in in uh, in the U.S. Any religion is immediately excised. Well, almost any religion. Um, but that's all that yoga is anyway. What they think yoga is, is nothing more than, than British calisthenics. Now, on the other hand, in India, the courts have removed some of uh, the yoga poses from their school system because they can't make that obligatory for non-Hindus. The courts in India say that it's so close to the Hindu tradition as a philosophical idea and a religious idea, inseparable in fact, that non-Hindus could ever be made to do it in a, in, a, in a government system. Now, the problem there is they're probably not talking about the same thing. In India, it's probably slightly more authentic, still probably of British origin, but in America, it's infinitely more vulgar. It is nothing more than stretching exercises. It's, 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 you know, no matter what these idiot, uh, 
uh, self-styled gurus tell you, um, it's no more than that. There is no religious element to it. In India, it might be slightly more so. But when you have Yengar saying that, that he had to go to London and the British told him what Hinduism, what the, what these all were, um, you realize what a, what a fraud it is. Now, the metaphysical background of some of the, the early yoga ideas, now we're going back, um, does come from a perennial tradition. Now, I'm not a big fan of the so-called traditionalists, traditionalists with a capital T. Um, although I love, you know, I read, um, um, Gunan and, and, um, 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 you know, that, that, you know, everyone in, in, in that realm, uh, Evola and their students that say the same things over and over again. Um, but they are correct in that there seems to be this perennial metaphysical idea that you find all over the planet. Now, a lot of this may just be the fact that Westerners don't know how to put anything except in terms that, that the Greeks used. Um, the basic idea is that, you know, the, the ego finds itself in a world of objects. But the ego is isolated, like in Descartes' system. It's shut up in this little world of, of fear and anxiety. What's different here is that forms and so-called essences of the external world or the creation of the ego itself. It only knows itself, so it imposes its own concept of individu- individuality onto the external world. Now, of course, that can't just be any ego. It can only be the most powerful. But that's reality today. The notion that, that there really isn't an external world, that this are, these are projections of a fearful... Um, uh, isolated ego. Well, the isolated ego is, is more of a modern creation. An isolated ego in the ancient world is, was unthinkable. But the Aristotelian division of the world into form and matter, they would say, and some, even some of the Neoplatonists would say, it's a creation of the fallen ego, not a reflection of the external world. If, if there is no notion of an external world, and therefore scientific objectivity is an illusion. So the elite ego this incessant desire to dominate, seek to create a world in their own image, so-called world of individual things. But the world is really made up of those things. Now, as far as the Hindu stuff is concerned, they love it when they start talking about the world uh, of this male-female energy linked together by Dharma, or the law, uniting all things together. Um, you know, that's what they love. Now, that's a whole separate issue. Um, but the problem with the Western world is that the modern conception stemming from the Enlightenment is that an entire global civilization has been created based on the lie of the individual. I'm seeing the, the nominalism-realism distinction as a political category more and more these days. I was the first one to, to make nominalism the root of our problems. Um, there may have been I'm thinking there may have been someone um, before, but but very obscure. I began writing about this 20 years ago, and now I'm starting to see it more and more. It definitely comes from me. But nominalism, um, the concept that universals don't exist. The idea is there is no such thing as goodness. There's only individual good actions. And the things that unite them are just in our head. Therefore, there are no universal truths. So even something like materialism can't exist because that's a universal, you know, it, it covers many objects. Um, but nominalism, where the claim is that only individuals exist and even the word individual is completely arbitrary, leads to nothing but struggle. The individuals constantly fighting one another and the rat race created by industrialization. But, you know, the, the, the Hindu approach, especially the, again, another Western tantric idea, sounds a lot more like Spinoza. In his confrontation with the with the uh, with the Aristotelians, than than it does anything else. So so much of this is pure Westernism, and usually very bad ones. The ever fashionable concept of Western style yoga, they use the language of of Sanskrit texts, and they create this small army of of very pretentious gurus seeking another spiritual experience. 
but there's no there's no definition of the term. Um, you know, the tantric approach was never you know sexualized. Well, you have people like Gavin and Yvonne Frost, whose book, um, um, the true tantra is is indulgence and abstinence alternating in a balance. It seeks the finer things they say in sex and in discipline, but usually only in areas that the upper middle class can afford. The frosts are a mockery of the, the legitimate profundity in, in, in the ancient texts, which they, they, they know nothing about. But taking the language of these ancient texts and trying to rewrite them, making them amenable to the suburban boomer liberal ideology, of course, mangles them beyond belief. The frost approach is, is little more than the libertine pseudo-spirituality of the upper middle classes, enshrining the ego-centeredness of the indulgent rather than the truth by reaching full knowledge of the Dharma. I don't think any of these people realize that asceticism was the initial purpose um, of it all. But even a notion like Tantra, the Tantric, which is mentioned all the time here, the term is not an Asian one. It's completely idiosyncratic. Um, but it's a set of practices and techniques with a focus on meditation. But much of this comes from Pierre Bernard, who died in 1955. Now, his system has no relation to India whatsoever. He practiced hypnotism to sexually assault women and what got a lot of, a lot of trouble for. Him. But in the 1920s, it didn't matter. He became very popular amongst the upper classes. He connected feminism to yoga to sexual liberation. Now, of course, Johnson's Law explains <laughs> he could say whatever he wanted and no one would know. Bernard was a president of the State Bank of Pearl River in New York and extremely self-indulgent. And he's one of the founders of this you know, so-called uh, uh, sex school. This is, a, this is a demonic idea, although you use a couple of lines from an ancient uh, Hindu text that probably doesn't exist, and the rest of it is nothing more than, than their own desires. Um, but David Gordon White tries to define Tantra this way. He says, it's an Asian body of beliefs. Asian, I, mean, you know, I don't know how vague that Asian body of beliefs and practices which working from the principle that the universe we experience is nothing other than the concrete manifestation of the divine energy of the Godhead that creates and maintains that universe seeks to ritually appropriate and channel that energy within the human microcosm in creative and emancipatory ways. Now, you read that two, three, four times and you realize that he says absolutely nothing. The word divine has nothing to do with God. It's not the creator of all things. Um, Krishnanada, Swami Krishnanada wrote uh, uh, an introduction to the philosophy of yoga. He puts it like this. He says, the greatest problem in life is involvement in objectivity, externality, the conditioned attitude of the mind by which it segregates itself from all things which it thinks or visualizes. The world of objects is a connected whole. This is the doctrine of yoga. The world is not constituted of isolated parts as it appears to the outward senses, perception. The recognition of this inward connectedness of all things form the universe is the endeavor of yoga. But that's strictly an, an ontological question. And many philosophical systems um, accept the same thing. And as you read these people, they start sounding very much like Spinoza. Um, you know, um, the ego understands itself as part of this all-embracing substance. I mean, what could it possibly mean in this so-called tantric idea that, that, that everything is divine energy? How can that possibly change your life? You have to so redefine the word divine as to make it absolutely uh, meaningless, which is exactly what they do. The individual is a creation of modernity. It's not a normal state. Uh, even a fallen man. Ancient philosophy of all civilizations posited the cosmos as a connected whole. There's nothing revolutionary about it. But Descartes and Hobbes created this notion of this isolated individual, this, this isolated ego. And that's the default ideology of the, of the Western drone. So, so far what you have with this, these definitions of yoga are 
you know, Western philosophical rebellions against modernity and having nothing to do with India. Uh, Alan Goulet writes in 1980 his uh, Towards the Philosophy of Holism. At this point, our ego merges with Shiva, which is itself categorically different from Shakti, being the source of all physical and subtle energy. Uh, Kodanali, uh, coiled up, the picture of the snake, Shiva's the sun. When these two things, male and female respectively, unite, the yogis in a state of higher consciousness being. Well, Shakti can be thought of being equivalent to finite energy, Shiva to infinite energy, or empty space, the source of being as we know it. Now, you know, I've read that maybe seven times. I'm not sure what his audience is, or who his audience is. But the only thing I get here is male and female. Of course, he's, so he's justifying all kinds of, of, of sexual liberation. But infinite energy, the source of being is empty space. Well, in the Kabbalah, of course, the so-called deity is the flux. That's what the Ensof actually is. It's meaninglessness. This is what they refer to when they're talking about the divine. So these so-called yoga texts, even those who try to be philosophical, um, you know, they're, they're taking it from, from there, not from anything uh, that's actually Indian. They want to, you know, bridge the gap of subjective, objective, man, woman, community, ego, external, internal, etc., using, of course, sexuality and sexual liberation as the vehicle. Um, you know, but what these people don't seem to understand is that this is an ascetic practice done by men in isolation from women. Um, Krishnanada, though, does say in, in The Psychology of Knowing, he says, the self-affirmation of the ego is charged with a deep impulsion towards survival of itself at the cost of anything whatsoever in the world. If we believe in the doctrine of the survival of the fittest, the ego says, I am the fittest, so I alone should survive and no one else. Naturally, if every ego has a sense of the fittest in itself, and each one is the fittest, the consequence is battle and war. These wars are nothing but conflicts of egos, each wishing to assert itself as the fittest, whether it is an individual or a group. These create a chaos of circumstances. If one goes to the inner secret and sorrows of life, one will realize that all of these are rooted in the ego principle. Understanding, willing, feeling, all the other psychological functions are the rays of the ego, which is apparent of all these manifestations. Well, the assumption here is that Western thought is Thomas Hobbes and Rene Descartes. But of course it is not. Most of these yoga texts go to Plato and Spinoza. And, you know, they simplify it and write that and claim that this is, this is the yoga idea. They're going to an ignorant population who doesn't know anything about this. Tells them how wicked nominalism is and give a few slogans about how, how awful it is that, um, everything is individual and, and everything fights each other and, and, uh, we're all one. But that has no actual meaning in 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 uh, in day to day life. So the whole notion of the, the yoga philosophy as it's put today is the ego sets itself up as absolute, which is a predicament that all human beings they they can't be absolute. This alienation sets up two different worlds: the inner and the outer. They don't exist, but the alienated ego creates them. Um, so to use. Plotinus, this is the ego falling headlong into a world of multiplicity. The purpose of yoga is to overcome this dualism by realizing, the, the, making the realization permanent that all is one, our ego is not essentially different from its surroundings. Being is being, one is one. The rest is illusion, but a very specific illusion created by the concept of the demanding ego. Well, much of this is interesting, except Every bit of it can be found either in Neoplatonism or the Fathers. Hegel talks about it in the Master-Slave Dialectics. Um, you know, doing battle with the external, so to speak. Um, so this is this is nothing new. This is nothing interesting as far as uh, uh, as far as as far as yoga is concerned. The only thing that I, I'm seeing here is that in a tantric idea, 
is that they start using male and female metaphors. The, that set of opposites that are unified or, or synthesized or gendered elements. Um, you know, but the Shiva is passive, dom- dominated by the female. He is passive and unaffected by the swirl of external events. The feminine or the Shakti is based on power. Now, this is something that has been, you know, remade and recreated. Um, you know, that has very little to do with actual Indian texts. These are things that any Westerner can find in the, in the Platonic tradition at any time. Um, now, there are some, you know, worthwhile things in the, in the yoga idea. But even those worthwhile things, aren't specifically Indian. You know, Shiva is associated with asceticism. It seeks to destroy the passions that lead to irrational behavior. But Tantra seeks the destruction of desire. So when you have these bankers from the 20s talking about, you know, Tantric being some kind of a sexual idea, um, it's nonsensical. So, um, the male principle is the ascetic one. Now, Shakti, the female principle is, is the mother, the matriarch, dominates Shiva. So, but since Shiva is beyond death and cannot be shaken, the dominance of Shakti amounts to nothing. Shakti dominates because it's about creating balance. Um, so this is, you know, the system is something that, that is most created using Western terms by Western writers coming from the world of British colonialism. Um, you know, when the British colonized India, it was the, the Brahmins who were their main allies. And so the leaders of the Hindus, again, the concept of Hindu comes from them in the first place, um, was was given to them, and this so-called theology was created at the time. You know, uh, the English came to to India after the Portuguese, um, and the word gentu, G-E-N-T-O-O, applied to any follower of any any Indian religion that they didn't understand. The code of gentu law was put together in 1773 under the orders of Warren Hastings. So the notion of Gentu became Hindu was never used until that period of time. Um, and this is how, uh, so Gentu, J A N T U E, that was an earlier version of it. Um, and they kept, quit, began rewriting the history of, of the country. Um, the concept of Hindu as applying to a religion didn't exist. Um, you know, so even, even right up until modern times, it was, it was unknown. So the in, Indian, English census compilers were assigned the task of trying to count Indian for the British government. So it was a census department that coined the term Hindu as a blanket term to encompass anyone that they really didn't know anything about. So a Hindu was anyone who wasn't a Muslim, a Christian, a Buddhist, or a gay. It was exclusive. Hinduism was defined by what it was not, not by what it was. Um, so Hinduism was used as a common name for that group by 1830. Um, and of course, the whole point was, the motive was making them loyal servants, the, the Brahmins. The Indians, the Europeans who came to India uh, to establish trade became the rulers of the country. But it was the Brahmins who were supporters and assistants for the Europeans to capture political power as a matter of strategy. Um, and the Brahmins were the, the, um, the, uh, the prime movers of it. None of this, I'm pretty sure, has anything to do with what these people, um, think Hinduism is. Or oh, I'm sorry, I think yoga is. And the concept of karma is something else I wanted to mention. I have an article out on this because it's such a stupid idea. And it's, it's one of the most dominant terms 
that people use anymore. It's in song lyrics and everything. I guess karma is in an age of organized atheism, as close to religion as the American mass ever gets. It's cited on a daily basis. It seems that the basic assumption is that bad things will eventually happen to those who do bad things. Which, of course, it implies an ordered universe without a creator, an eternal law without an eternal lawmaker. It's a religion for atheists. So if an evil person steps on a Lego, the popular mind says it's karma. And, of course, it's always understood as feminine. It's usually described as a bitch. When, especially when the, the, the misfortune is, is particularly satisfying. But this is what alienated people fall back on when there's nothing left to fight. Everything that the mass believes, it's distorted, it's self-serving. And just like yoga, it has no connection to its initial Indian roots. Karma is usually more formally defined as intentional action, although usually the intention, the mental state preceding action. An action generates karma only as a moral state of mind. In, in the, in the Indian mentality. The, the results aren't significant. But that's where the modern mind places it. But it's connected with reincarnation. So good acts, morally speaking, lead to a, uh, incarnation better off than the present one. So our own present state of affairs is dictated by past lives. That implies that the lives of, of the next incarnation are determined, although modern commentators generally don't, don't accept that. But if it's determined, then the system is mechanical and not related to morality. But you have so many texts where it's related. It's a matter of cosmic law. Uh, Sakyong Nipam says, like gravity, karma is so basic we often don't even notice it. And he says, karma moves in two directions. If we act virtuously, the seed we plant will result in happiness. If we act non-virtuously, suffering results. Um... Now, in the Dhyampada, the sayings of Buddha, in chapter 1, we read this. All that we are is a result of what we've thought. It is founded on our thoughts. It's made up of thoughts. If a man speak or acts with evil thought, pain follows him. As the wheel follows the foot of the ox that draws the carriage. All that we are is a result of what we've thought. It's founded on our thoughts, made up of our thoughts. If a man speaks or acts with a pure thought, happiness will follow him. It's like a shadow that never leaves him. Now, a phenomenon exists for us because we put a value judgment on it. This is the simplest definition of the term. It just states that the evil man will be surrounded by evil, because that's what they wish to create. But you don't have to be a Buddhist to believe any of this. Um, things don't exist, but only to the extent that they're judged. If all is will, and the will is evil, then all is evil. So it is, it's, it's uninteresting. Um, you know, karma is the volition that creates action. The, the vipaka is what manifests in the world, what comes back. Vipaka is mental and separated from the physical realm. Um, but, um, that's the point. If, if cognition centers around the rejection of the passions, that no evil will done. Our intentions will be pure. And that comes from the uh, that comes from chapter twenty-two of the uh, Athelini. All created things are grief and pain. Um, in the works of Peter Harvey, uh, the selfless mind, personality, constant in Nirvana, and early Buddhism, karma he 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 describes it as inherent in phenomena, not a mechanical process. He calls it a fluid and dynamic process. He says the law of karma is seen as natural law inherent in the nature of things, like the law of physics. It's not operated by a god, and indeed the gods are themselves under its sway. Good and bad rebirths are not, therefore, seen as rewards or punishments, but as simply the natural results of certain kinds of actions. Now, whenever you read a book on karma, they will go out of their way sometimes at great length to say that God has nothing to do with this and there is no morality. They always put good and bad in, in quotes. Well, if it's in the nature of things, like the law of physics, then it's certainly not fluid. They want to claim that it's not a determinist idea, then they go and describe it as a natural process. 
they use good and bad in quotes, but the way it's used every day, it, there's a very distinctive idea of what's good and bad in our in our actions. The principle that things are reborn according to the nature and quality of their past actions, the so-called heir to their actions. This is a cosmic, a very complex cosmic moral system with no creator, only subject. But even nature and quality are value judgments on an absolute scale. But no Buddhist can claim this. So you'll read people like Robert Gethin and, and they'll say, that, well, there's no, there's no determinism here. There's no determinate relationship between an act and its later moral consequence. It has nothing to do with morality. And again, no God, because God doesn't exist. Um, but, you know, then they'll talk about that, you know, it's, but it's not deterministic and it's purely fluid and anything can fit into it. But that's not the ancient doctrine. Um, you know, um, karma is not a system. Damien Cohn writes, Kuhn writes, karma is not a system of rewards and punishments meted out by God, but a kind of natural law akin to the law of gravity. Individuals are thus authors of their good and bad fortune. Well, gravity is certainly determined, and bad situations have been created by the sufferer. But I don't know what akin means, akin to the, the law of gravity. It makes it meaningless. Gravity is just a metaphor here. So they all talk, and this is book after book after book. They all say the exact same kind of things. They associate it with natural forces, but then say it's not determined. Um, and it, it's become so, so muddled. So then they'll say that rather than being judged by God, they're natural aspects of the cosmic world. But it's a very weak distinction. How the natural order contains these mechanistic moral laws isn't described. Neither are how these moral ideas can even be gleaned by what are purely natural mechanisms. So their sole motivation seems to be that they describe everything that God does, but refuse to name him. So they end up being absurd and contradictory. Since the doctrine of incarnation, reincarnation says animal forms can recreate as human, this implies that animals are moral actors that can generate enough karma to be promoted in the next life. But animals can only be themselves. They're not free. They're not rational. Children, too, can create karma in this system. But that's never described. Passionlessness could only be the domain of thinking human beings and not animals. So, therefore, there has to be a different criteria for animals to be promoted to, to a different reincarnation. But whatever it is, it's not freely granted. But Americans hold to karma because there's no justice. They live in a rapacious oligarchy that's destroyed the very idea of absolute good upon which any doctrine of justice might might rest. Karma is a pseudo-mystical belief that no matter what, the evil will eventually suffer, even if it takes generations. But abulia will lead to these doctrines and be reinforced because of them. It's the moral theory of lethargy. The lethargy that, that derives from rejecting absolutes and it will eventually create such a system. But even to claim that moral acts claim, contain their own punishment is, is uninteresting. I mean, most people hold to some version of that. And something could be unjust without anyone really recognizing it as such. People are assuming that we all know what good and bad acts are, and this is then imposed onto the world. And how stupid to hear people refer to the universe as a thing. The universe is doing this to me. And they ascribe to, to they, they, it doesn't matter what word they use, they ascribe God-like power to it, but they can't use God or good or evil. They'll talk about it at length. Um, you know, um, but it, it makes them seem absurd. Um, an evildoer will suffer regardless of whether or not he's aware of the purpose of life. So in a corrupt society, an evil man may not know he's evil. So therefore, there can't be any karma because there's no intention. Justice remains the same, regardless of, of how corrupt the society is. So the modern understanding is ridiculous. What people think is good is often very evil. So therefore, karma has no role because it has to do solely with intention. 
karma existed to justify the Indian caste system, or at least with the natural outgrowth of it. Karma is based on the idea that our actions cannot change the world in any way, that the world is static in its structure, because what we do now is dictated by what's been done before. It explains existence, but no means to change it. Karma is a context for action, provides content for good and bad nature, but but nothing more. The caste was a functional category, was based on action, the ground of action. To be born to the Brahmin caste mean, meant that your previous incarnation must have been must have earned this right somehow. So what we're talking about here is this mangling of what people think is an ancient Indian tradition that I think really the Beatles had a lot to do with and the Theosophists and everybody else. And things like karma and reincarnation are, are part of day-to-day life. Karma far more so than reincarnation. Reincarnation is a problem. Uh, but if there is no absolute, then reincarnation is really the, the, the best that the human mind can do unaided. The total lack of awareness of past lives is is a problem. Um, the whole purpose of the doctrine of reincarnation and karma is learning and developing so as to become free, which is what yoga is supposed to help do. Um, but the soul can't learn anything if previous information is not retained. No lessons can be learned without memory. I don't know if some of you have looked at some of these past lives, hypnotism and, and, and recollection. They're usually very bad PC history. Like, you know, I was a guard in a concentration camp or something like that. You know, something very fashionable, something that everyone knows. And hypnosis is used to gain access here. But of course, hypnosis, this people think it's not a trance. It's just focused attention. It's the misdirection oligarchy requires in order to function. It's not an altered state of mind. And you can't go back to your consciousness and discover anything new. TV has taken over completely here. And I've spoken about this before, where repressed memories, you know, there are men sitting in prison because of repressed memories that have been removed by, you know, pristine from, you know, some, some hyp- hyp- hypnotist. It's a myth. There are no natural means to create a trance and, and, and the normal set of hypnosis sort of hypnosis has no relation to getting access to anything. But men are sitting in prison because the jurors thought a woman was in a trance and remembered horrible events that she'd been repressing for decades. But none of that is true. But these doctrines do have real consequences. Now, it doesn't mean sin fails to have ontological consequences. It does. It's one of the central doctrines of the church. It doesn't mean our psyche is protected from evil acts. It's damaged by them sometimes permanently. But that's not how the term is used conversationally. Kind people are usually the first to be targeted by the unscrupulous. The only thing that's rewarded in business and politics is deviousness, not intelligence. Treating your workers kindly will place you at a disadvantage because your competitors will, they're not so self-hearted. Stories abound, women destroying their, their husband's lives by marrying a wealthy man, showing her with rewards that none of us can even imagine. But, you know, she gets out of her Ferrari and trips. It's not karma. You know, postmodern life brings out these contradictions better than, than ancient societies ever could. Evil is rewarded, especially if it's done by the right person. But even now, words like evil and bad mean something very different today than it used to, making the doctrine even more useless. But karma is the scream of the powerless, the lethargic. They have nothing to fight for. People don't get what they deserve. The evil prosper. Those that are billionaires usually haven't earned it. You can't, you couldn't earn billions anyway. Those with extraordinary talent are usually overlooked. For people who have greater connections or more malleable, more ideologically uh, uh, focused. Incompetence are promoted because they're a better fit for the organization. And that's the rule. Karma can't be used as a way to argue that the wealthy have built up enough positive karma that they deserve their riches, assuming that you see riches as good in the first place. But but that is music to the ears of the elite. 
So those with unearned billions can say, wait a minute, this must be karmic justice. Someone in my past must have allowed me to earn this, therefore I should keep it and not feel guilty about it. So, um, and you know, a lot of this comes out with Arthur Schopenhauer was a devotee of Buddhism. And he really, all the thing he came out with it was this a disembodied will as the cause and end of all. It creates the world of false images connected with the passions. But that was difficult to argue with. Uh, but Buddhist doctrine is strict on its assistance on a law bound universe. Each level of being with its own code of laws and strict rules that, that govern it. And Schopenhauer has always been very useful here because at least some of his ideas, he claims, were taken from the uh, research of interest in that in that part of the world in, in his day. Um, you know, will becomes objectified in archetypes, and those archetypes are the grounds of creation. Will, I mean, with a capital W, is, is this mechanistic agent that has no personality. So he's a Kantian to the extent that our own will imposes space and time in these archetypes, and therefore the world is our own reflection, so to speak. The appearances around us are created by the structure of the mind. But this will is aimless, it has no purpose, it's just purposeless striving that ends only in frustration, or the extinguishing of the passion. Our own will creates individual, or, sorry, our own will creates individuals, and therefore the struggle among them. The only way out is to extinguish the passion. Well, Schopenhauer and the notion of, of yoga are similar in this regard. Um, but, again, to what extent these are philosophically reflected in the ancient texts is another matter. And uh, I'm not even talking about uh, Buddhism here, but Schopenhauer, again, his, his theory was connected with the, with the, the idealism of, of his age and has nothing to do directly with Buddhism. He was influenced by it, but he's not taking this from it. But Schopenhauer is another, uh, another reason that Western ideas got confused with a retelling of Indian sources. Because people think that this is just his retelling of the Buddhist idea. And the way, when we put it in Western philosophical terms, it sounds very similar. But that's simply not the case. The concept of, of, of yoga and, um, karma are both of Western creation. You can't, you can't even call it appropriation. Because no one's reading these ancient texts. The entire context of these things, uh, would make them incomprehensible to your typical, uh, uh, Lululemon employee. Um, so when you study actually what karma really is, you realize it has nothing to do with people getting their just desserts. Because that has to do with what justice is, what good is. And given this society, what's considered good and what's considered bad has no relationship to reality. It has more, more relationship to media than anything else. Um, you know, a um, guy by the name of uh, Mahasi uh, Sayadaw in Buddhist Studies he says, it's a doctrine of karma that gives consolation, hope, reliance, and moral courage to the Buddhist. When the unexpected happens, and he meets with difficulties, failures, misfortune, the Buddhist realizes that he is reaping what he has sown, he's wiping off his past debt. Instead of resigning himself, leaving everything to karma, he makes an effort to pull the weeds and sow useful seeds in their place, for the future is in his hands. So they're always trying to square these circles, trying to fit American individualism into a doctrine designed to justify a totally ossified world order and a tradition-bound world for which Western audiences have absolutely no patience. To think that you could take an idea from medieval uh, India and fit it into postmodern America is laughable. Because no one, uh, none of these postmodern devotees have any idea how a traditional society would actually operate. Um, you know, the whole notion of, of libertarian willfulness based on a consumer idea didn't exist at the time or in industry and everything else, purposes of the individual. None of this existed at the time. So it can't be what you hear every day. 
There is no soul in Buddhism. There is no individual in Buddhism. Categories are the products of samsara, or as Schopenhauer would call them, individuation. Individuation that has nothing to do with reality. It's the angry, uh, frustrated projections of the um, frustrated will. Because of this, karma is mostly a bad thing, because it determines one's reincarnation, which shows the soul, or something like that, had reached its proper state to be released from this hell on earth. It winds up positing a soul in a doctrine that rejects the soul, in a universe under eternal laws that has no lawgiver. Reality is will, but that only begs the question. These guys use words like divine, but refuse to talk about God. They talk about a deterministic system, but then scream and yell it has nothing to do with determinism. They talk about relativism, then talk about how good and evil acts are uh, rewarded or not in the karmic system. Um, but, you know, karma, yoga, these were popularized through the Theosophical Society. Um, and the so-called New Age reinterpretations is what most people think this stuff really is. Um, you know, uh, this is, this is, this is a struggle. We're living in an age of complete fraud and inauthenticity. Yoga has nothing to do with ancient India. Karma has nothing to do with ancient either Hinduism or Buddhism. Both of these are the results of scam artists and a world that has no justice, or at least a society that has no justice. This is the scream of the powerless. This is the, the mating call of a bulia. Thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.